Hello, my name is Carlinthia and I am with the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. You can visit the Haitian American Museum at 4654 Racine Avenue or contact us at www.hammock.org. You can also email us at info at hammock.org or call us at 773-213-1869. Today, at, with um, Pali Avec Hamok, we will be discussing uh, the amount of um, Haitian immigrants that are participants in the um, 2016 Olympics. But before that, I will introduce you to my guest, Jaive Hector. Jaive is actually a young Haitian artist from Haiti. He was brought here by the Haitian American Museum. Uh, for his upcoming exhibit. He's actually been to the museum before. He was at the museum last year for an exhibit and is coming up this year just to show his new stuff. Jaib, how are you doing today? I'm good, Kalintia. What about you? I am doing good. How are you enjoying Chicago for your second time? Um, it's the next, um, next experience, so I feel good. Now. He's, he's good. He's enjoying it. So, um, Jave is a young artist. He's 19 years old, um, 20 years old, actually. And he has had some spectacular paintings. His work was actually featured in the documentary we spoke about at our last, um, our last show here. And, um, Jave, I just want you, if you could explain to the viewers how you started painting, what inspires you to paint? Um, I started painting when, when I was uh, um, 12 years old. Mm -hmm. um, after my father uh, was dead, mm -hmm. so it's what, uh, before he, he, he was um, like um, a support for me. Right. So after my father dead, so mm -hmm. um, I, I need something to like to like to en to enjoy me, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so, so now I I start to paint so like that, and I start to forget him, you know. Okay, that's so. Then I notice um, in your work, mm -hmm. you don't really paint like um, most Haitian artists. You would see they paint landscape art. You seem to paint more abstract pieces. Why do you like painting in that style? What about that style do you enjoy? Um, I start with like landscape. Mm -hmm. Oh, you so, started with landscape, okay. So, yeah. so after, like, I start to, like, I, I, I want to, like, um, express myself. Right. So I start to paint, like, um, a very, um, like, uh, my, I want to, like, show my own feelings. Right. So for that, I paint a style, like, abstract, something mm -hmm. like that. Okay, so... You said you wanted to um, express your feeling mm -hmm. in your abstract art. When you painted, I noticed some of your paintings when you did the um, the, the zombie documentary. What were you feeling in some of your paintings? Because some of them look very angry. <laughs> um, and the zombie like um, experience, mm -hmm. uh, it's not something about um, like deeply about uh, the. Asian culture, like the zombie mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. So, and those paintings, because I have like, um, like, how can I say, a bad experience okay. in my like my childhood. You okay. know, so, so just I want to express myself to mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. to show my feelings about you know what what make me sad, you know, mm -hmm. what make me mad, something. Like that. So, do you want to be a, an artist? When Is that what you're aiming for? Or do you just uh, enjoy doing art as a hobby? What, where do you see art is going to take you? But this question I cannot um, like, um, give you a full answer. Okay. Because I don't know yet. What so, I need to so, do you want to be an, you're, you're not sure if you want to be an artist? Is that what you're um, saying? It depends on the future. 
okay it depends on the future um hopefully i i know you're trying to get into um, the art institute so hopefully mm -hmm. that works out now when is your next exhibit because i know you came to the museum mm -hmm. you um came up to Chicago this time because you do have an exhibit coming up and also you were part of the um, the screening for the zombie documentary, the opening screening. Mm -hmm. When is your next exhibit? When could we look forward to seeing your art being displayed at the museum? Um, my next exhibit is uh, August 19th. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and is that at the Haitian American Museum? That's where your next exhibit is? Yes, yeah, Addition I'm making this, yeah. Okay, and I know I was reading that you also have a live performance at the Fulton, uh, the Fulton Art Collective or Street Collective. When is that going to be? Uh, it will be um, on August 17th. Okay, so um, I guess if you're looking for um, some Haitian-inspired art, you could come to the Haitian American Museum on August 19th at 6 o'clock p.m. We will be um, featuring uh, artist Jaives Hector's work. So come join us at the Haitian American Museum. Come uh, share his work, enjoy his work. And uh, Jaives, thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And remember, you could um, see Jaime's art at the Haitian American Museum at 4654 North Racine, Chicago, Illinois. If you want any more information, you can visit us at, at call us at 773-213-1869. Um, so my next guest is actually my co-host, and that is... Danette Frederick. Danette Frederick is actually a volunteer at the Haitian American Museum. I met her when I started volunteering at the Haitian American Museum. She had been volunteering for a while. She, she's going to be a recent graduate of Northwestern University, and she is actually of Haitian descent. How are you doing today, Danette? I'm well, Carlympia. How are you? I am doing good. <laughs> so, um, so like I was telling our viewers today, we're actually going to be this year is actually a big year for Haitians in the Olympics. Um, a lot of Haitians, particularly in Chicago, are really excited about the Haitian swimmer we have um, in the Olympics because this year um, would be the first year he sh um, Haiti has a swimmer in the Olympics in, I think, t in the last 20 years. So they have both a man and a woman, and I think this year would be the first year that they have a female representative. So, um, why do you, like, I just want your opinion on this, why do you think there is such a big stir about, um, you know, um, people from less developing countries in the Olympics? The, the Olympics is for everybody to partake in, but it seems like this year there's their their the refugees have their own team um the haitian seems to have um, more of representation so what do you think about that is causing more of a stir i don't know mm -hmm. if you have an opinion on that i, I can think of some opinions okay First, <laughs> we could say less developed in quotation marks less right? I like developing because i like to talk about why those countries are considered less developed right and that's one <laughs> of the thing with these stories mm -hmm. is that not to take away from the achievements of these athletes, because right. obviously they're great athletes. They've mm -hmm. made it to compete in one of the biggest, in the biggest competition in the world. Right. And so, but the thing about these stories, you see them on like the Washington Post or Chicago Tribune mm -hmm. about um, Naomi, what's her last name? Grand Naomi Grandpia, uh huh. Right, the swimmer from U Chicago. Right. And also there's a Haitian boxer, right? Yes, there is a Haitian boxer. I think this is the first time Haiti will be represented in boxing in a long time, but mm -hmm. Haiti has won a bronze medal, I believe, in okay. boxing. So, so they've won a medal for that. Cool. Well, see, the thing with, like, the boxer, for example, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there have been a lot of Haitians with the passion and the desire to box or to play sports. Right. But then the article is focused on how the lack of facilities or equipment that they have to train people. Right. So when you get a Haitian boxer that makes it, it's this huge thing about, mm -hmm. wow, a Haitian made it. But those kind of stories kind of perpetuate this narrative of like, 
people in less developed countries are <laughs> capable of doing such things when we don't, the articles never talk about why there are no facilities in their right. country or what. I understand there aren't, but why? You really know? quick though, you, the less, before we get into the less developed countries, um, I was reading an article today and um, when you were saying they like to stress upon, um, it's such an achievement for people in developing countries to be in the Olympics because, you know, they have less amenities. The the gymnasts, I think Simone Biles, or, um, there was this controversy about the newspaper always highlighting her background before they recognize her achievements. Right. So um, when the newspapers would write about her, they would express how she came from a drug-addicted father and an abandoned mother or, you know... And that was the highlight of the story mm -hmm. before they got into her achievements. And it seems like um, the what drives a lot of, I guess, what drives the talk about athletes from um, developing nations um, actually making it to the Olympics, even among ourselves for, um, as people from developing nations, is, you know, like, oh, we, we came so far. Right. Um, um, and look, we finally made it. Now... That also poses the question, do you think it's, do you think it's fair game um, having athletes such as these to compete in the Olympics? Because um, the Naomi Grandpierre, the Haitian swimmer who's competing in this year Olympics, I think she's actually competing on Thursday or Friday. I'm not sure when the sport goes on. But she trained at U Chicago where she went to school. The male swimmer, who a lot of people don't know about, actually trained in Haiti and they were showing um, a lot of the times he the pool he practiced in was an 18 meter pool whereas um, in the Olympics he would have it's been 15. competing in it yeah so then yeah. I wonder um, you know if it's if it's fair also because there's a lot of hype about you know the refugee team and have these people been training for years for this do you right. think it's fair game that they, well, they do have a fair chance at winning the gold um, well, it's not fair, obviously, to be. Mm -hmm. It's a huge disadvantage to practice in an 18-meter <laughs> pool when the actual pool is 50 meters. Mm -hmm. But it goes to show how resilient and how strong and how capable people right. in these less developed countries are. You see what I mean? Right. And then my thing is that we set up all these... There are huge systems that go into setting up these obstacles for people from these countries. Mm -hmm. And once these people struggle and achieve and overcome these obstacles you just applaud and write articles about them, but we never talk about why those obstacles are there in the first right. place, what we can do to get rid of those obstacles. And so that's my problem whenever we have the Olympics or some event, mm -hmm. everyone, or a um, gymnast like Simone, an event comes up, mm -hmm. everyone, whoa, she came from a drug addicted background and now right. she's doing this. Okay, well, <laughs> why don't we stop the situations that make people have to come from these drug addicted backgrounds right. instead of, waiting for people to overcome them and then just clapping for them and forgetting about all the other people right. who have the potential to achieve the way that Simone did or the Haitian swimmer, you know? Do you think Naomi or um, the male swimmer has a chance at taking gold? Because he said, you know... Um, yes, he has he a chance. He practiced in an 18-meter <laughs> pool and made it to the Olympics, so... Okay, so what about artists? Like, look at... Um, um, athletes like Usain Bolt. They're from developing countries. I mean, people... I guess the difference would be: Does he practice here in the in the U.S. where he has the amenities available to him? I'm sure at this so, point, with all the money and sponsorships he's gotten, he probably has all true. the pra the necessary equipment he needs. Right. That's what happens. They make you struggle and struggle and struggle until you <laughs> make it in the limelight. Then they buy you up with all these sponsorships, and then you know. <laughs> Remember, everyone watching, this is a live call-in show, so feel free to call us at three one two. 738-1060 and that number again is 312-738-1060 so um so back to the olympics and um haiti again or or just the developing nations i'm from saint lucia and then i think um like what i have been realizing in the last few years or the last few months actually there's been heightened awareness about um you know, immigrants around the world, people from a, you know, who's um, first or second generation, um, you know, feeling some sense of pride or taking, or how would I say it, um, acknowledging their 
their um, ancestral roots, where they were from. Mm-hmm. Um, I was reading an article about this um, ex NFL player who, um, who um, his parents are Saint Lucian, and he wants to compete now in the Olympics as a um, on the Saint Lucian team. So, do you think I I because the way I see it, I feel like that will give. You know, he's trained here in the U.S., he's practiced here in the U.S. That would give him some sort of advantage to sure. compete. Um, but he's one out of the five athletes we have, so maybe right. he may not, um, um, I, I guess he may, maybe, may well, not I mean, I, I, like, I think it's great that people who grew up in the States feel that pride to want to represent their home country. Because, mm-hmm. you know, <clears throat> the States pulls a bunch of talent from other people mm-hmm. and they have all the resources Mm-hmm. to create these super athletes. Mm-hmm. So it's nice that someone would want to use the resources in this country and then apply it to represent their own. What do you think of um, the refugee team this year? Is, is that the first year I oh, believe the there's The one from a, South Sudan, right? Like just a whole bunch of, I think it's just refugees from all around creating a refugee team because oh. this year we've just had an, um, you know, with the with um, ref- Syrian refugees and refugees from um, continuous refugees from Africa, so then there are people who just don't belong, and then um, I guess they finally decided to create their own team in the Olympics. What do you think of the refugee team? I mean, the, like, I kind of along the same vein. Like that's mm-hmm. great. Look how capable these people are. They're mm-hmm. refugees. They come from war war torn houses. Okay. Mm-hmm. Probably lost their families, and they can still compete in the same sporting events as people who have grown up in the states, in right. England, in Sweden, who have all the resources, everything they need. But do you think and again? <laughs> look how we're talking about it. We look at their background, and we assess whether or not they're eligible. Um, we ass- we look at their background and not really assess whether or not they're eligible to participate, but um, we can't acknowledge their achievements for being in without looking at their background. Right, they are, also like they calling from. them the refugee team as right. if being a refugee is their main identity. Like these right. are people who come from places, who have passions, you mm-hmm. just throw them on a refugee team. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> But I guess a lot of a lot of um, a lot of people in this circumstance, um, uh, yeah, a lot of people in, in that circumstance when you have no home, like the Haitians, pay attention to um, Haitians in Dominican Haitians who live in the Dominican Republic who were sent out. Mm-hmm. Um, now they have no, I guess, place to call home where they can be considered part of the refugee team. Before we get to that, we actually have a caller. Um, hi, caller, you're on the air. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I have a quick question. And my question is, um, what can the people outside Haiti, the diaspora mm-hmm. population can do to help the Haitians be more visible in Olympics so that they could have a better delegation? Hmm. You could, could you want to repeat the question? So yes, that's what I was going to say. Do you mind repeating the question? No, we can repeat it. We can repeat okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think the caller, hello? Do you want? So basically the question was, what can institutions and organizations in the diaspora, the Haitian diaspora, do to support um, and rally, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, Haitian athletes? Right. Or, okay. I think um, there's already one one slight problem with that. Um, Number one, they need to um, institute a lot more uh, maybe Haitian organizations. So if you want Haitian organizations to assist Haitian athletes and support Haitian athletes so that there can be more Haitian athletes in the Haitian Olympics, then there should be more Haitian organizations that are um, set up to doing that kind of thing. Because here in Chicago, we have a few Haitian organizations, the Haitian American Museum being one of them. But in a lot of places, like when I lived in Kentucky, there are not many Haitian organizations. So then there are not many organizations set up to help people from the diaspora so then they don't help, so then they don't get help. True, but Mm -hmm. for the ones that are in existence, ways that they can help, for example, the Haitian American Museum of Chicago right. could host a viewing for when the Haitian American swimmer is about now, to do an event. Things right. like that. I know it may not necessarily be art, right? But, um, right. but still, people could say swimming is an art, sport is an art, and at the end of the day, we are Haitian, and it is the right. Haitian American Museum. So, right. 
Yeah. Now that is a way to help Haitian athletes that are already in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So then we're su we're um, supporting these athletes, you know, by um, um, we could screen the day they're showing or screen the day they're competing or um, that kind of thing. Now, was her question um, how could they support people who want to be athletes? I know a lot of um, athletes from developing nations say they um, they started going to school in. Um, in the United States or in a more developed country, um, and their passion is competing in sports, eventually they do get the school or um, some outside organization to help them to compete. But as far as having um, Haitian organizations help Haitian athletes compete in the Olympics, then... Um, then we would need more organizations, right. number one. And also one. definitely, yeah, and funding, funding. Period, right. funding, we would need money. Funding. Everyone needs money all the time. Right. So. We have one more caller. We're going to take this caller real quick. Caller, you're on the air. Oh, yes, young ladies, both of Listen, do you think it's right that people from other countries come here to the United States, use up all their grants, whether, whether I don't care about the Olympics or or, or being doctors or whatever it is, they use up money uh -huh. that that the people of the United States could use to uh, train their Olympic team and train their doctors. Do you think it's right that that then they go to other countries, sometimes not even their own, mm -hmm. just to make an extra buck? Do you think that's right? I don't think it's right. Do you? you um, either, if you're educated here, you stay here. Period. So you're asking, do I think it's right that um, people from other countries come to the U.S., use their resources, and then go back to their country? I'm just trying to get that clear, caller. I think he's off. So, so that, that's what he was saying? I think, I believe that's what he was saying. Um, so, I mean, a lot of, to begin with, um, um, a lot of um, universities or people that bring people from the U.S. over are private institutions or private companies. I think they're completely free to do whatever they want with their money. And if they think it's okay to bring in a student from another country to educate them, and then um, the contract states that the student or person has no ties or obligations to the country or to the company, I think it's completely okay for whoever this person is to go right. back because it's the, same, it's the same way that a lot of American companies go to foreign um go to foreign countries and um they build factories or they use their resources they use the people and then all the income they get goes back to the developed countries they go back to the united states so um there and they're also i mean something to consider are the u.s's immigration laws right which make it hard for people to get permanent residency mm -hmm. or you know so there's a whole so Bunch unless of bureaucratic right obstacles that keep people unless from staying in the country staying here so then and you have even to move if out. they don't want to stay in the country mm -hmm. i mean it's not uncommon for the us to pull a lot of resources from these very same countries so when those people don't have the ability to study or get the training they need in their own country i mean it seems natural that they would come to the united states to get that training and then return so as we have seen in many years many of these countries have been to other developed countries and also use their resources. Right. Um, it's not like the U.S. is just twiddling its thumbs and immigrants <laughs> are coming and taking all, you know, there's, let's not pretend there's not a whole history. Thank there. you so much, caller. You riled up some um, very active <laughs> debate, very live debate. You're one of our very, well, second caller for the day. And thank you. We appreciate your call. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Danette, so much for oh, being sure. here. Um, we're thank glad we're Jaive. Jaive, thank you, Jaive Hector, also so much for being here. Just remember that Jaive has an exhibit um, on August 19th. It is at the Haitian American Museum. And remember, the Haitian American Museum is at 4654 North Racine. Mm -hmm. That exhibit will begin at 6 p.m. So please come mm -hmm. see Jaive's exhibit. And join us again every second Tuesday of the month. We will be here with um, discussing immigration issues with the Haitian American Museum. My name is Carlinthia, and thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.